Hello, thanks for watching this video. This is a screencast of a talk that I gave at GDC a couple of weeks ago called Practical Unit Tests, and my name's Andrew Frey. We're going to talk today about how to structure unit tests to aid iteration speed. We're going to look in detail at my unit tests from a SHIP AAA console project, the mistakes I made in my to them and the concrete costs that they caused. And then we'll look at simple ways to avoid these costs in your own project. What we're not going to talk about is test-driven development. Everything we talk about from now on will be applicable to you whether you write your test before or after your code. And we're also not going to talk about advocacy. If you want to know why you should write unit tests, then this talk on the vault, on the GDC vault, if you have access, is very good. So this is me, Andrew Frey. I've used unit tests in my personal projects for a long time. I had a open source unit testing framework for the Unity game engine for a while, but that's now deprecated because Unity have their own decent built-in tools. In terms of ship products using unit tests, these, these three stand out. Uh, Thrillville, the first one, was a PSP, PS2, Xbox game that had these Super Monkey Ball style minigames in them. In fact, some of them were actually Super Monkey Ball minigames. They were small and they were very quick to do. They were single programmers, so like experimental using unit tests in some of them. The next chance I got to use it commercially was F1 2011, which we're going to talk about in more detail. And that had a really good suite of unit tests in them. And finally, my current company that I work for, Spyfox, we have an unannounced title that uses a substantial amount of unit tests. So to get everyone on the same page, we're going to cover some basic definitions. First of all, a unit test is a single piece of automated code that exercises a function and checks a single explicit assumption about that function. And this should be external behavior only. An integration test in comparison, some of you might call this a smoke test. Um, the definition for this is kind of fuzzy, uh, a functional test maybe. But an integration test would take many functions or systems, connect them end to end, put data in one end and get data out the other. It's still got that single explicit assumption about how the data should be transformed, but it's also got many implicit assumptions about how those systems connect up. Whereas with a unit test, you try and isolate the function of the test as much as you can from other systems so you don't bring in any impl implicit assumptions. And what makes a unit test good? We're going to look at some examples of what a bad unit test, but how do we know when a unit test is good? Well, a good unit test, and this is according to Royal Shiro from his book, Art of Unit Testing, a good unit test is readable. That is, you can look at it and very quickly figure out how it's doing what it's doing. It's maintainable, so you can open it up and change how it's doing what it's doing. And it's trustworthy. That means when it fails, it fails because the explicit assumption no longer holds and never for any other reason. It's not non-deterministic. It doesn't depend on external resources. It's not slow. And these are all kind of equal waiting. That's why I've put them in this kind of weird order. Uh, and if any two of these are sufficiently high, they can drag the third one up with it. You can kind of imagine how something that's maintainable and trustworthy will probably be a bit readable as well. So let's discuss that project I was talking about. So it, it was F1, cross-platform. Um, I was able to use unit tests on, on such a commercial-minded project as F1, you know, license IP, yearly iterations. I was able to use them because we had this nice new isolated subsystem. Uh, I knew that I was probably going to be the only one working on it. Sufficiently small that I could be the only one working on it, yet sufficiently chunky that using unit tests would be a good exercise. It was well isolated from other systems. It sat on top of them. It had a well-defined API, so I knew my unit tests weren't going to spread out to other parts of the code. It took me about eight months to finish it, and by the end, it had about 502 tests with about 6.7 thousand lines of test code. And that supported 6.2 thousand lines of production code. So you can see there's roughly a one-to-one -one correlation between lines of test code and lines of production code. But was it good? Was it a good idea to do this? It was a partial success. I was happy that I did it and I would do it again, but there are things I'd like to improve. The good parts of it were that the code was clean and reusable. Now, you can do this without unit tests, but unit tests force you to make these small, highly cohesive, low coupling systems so they can be unit tested well. Anecdotally, it had fewer bugs than comparable systems. 
traditionally F1 was a very buggy project. If any of you played it, then you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, and this system comparatively was easy to implement and relatively bug free. And it was also easy to optimize. Uh, it was an AI system and at the core of the system was relatively expensive. So we brought in a proper gray beard graphics programmer and he used vector intrinsics to speed up the inner loop of the AI massively. But if you ever read vector intrinsics, then you know that they're quite hard to read and reason about, even if you're the guy that wrote it. So the gray beard was extremely grateful that there are these unit tests there to test that the external functionality of the system hadn't changed. But what was bad? At the end, progress was very, very, very slow. It was difficult to add something without causing multiple compile errors or multiple unit test failures. Uh, and so it became very, very tempting in the end of the project to start disabling unit tests, which is not the place you want to be. And I think I've established a couple of reasons why that was. And I'm going to go over them now. I'm going to kind of show you the mistakes I made. And I like make them generic enough to be an anti-pattern and then show you how you could fix them. Now, there were more mistakes than this. We could talk for a long time about those mistakes. But for you, I've just highlighted four, the four most important ones, I feel. So the first one I've called the opaque anti-pattern. And the opaque anti-pattern happens when you open up a unit test and you get this dense scrunch of not very expressive code where you can't, even though it's a fluent interface, you can't quite figure out what's going on here. And you're like, what? It's not very readable code. And if it's not very readable, that means it's hard to see how it's doing what it's doing. But specifically, what do we mean by that? Well, let's, as an example, these two tens, are they the same 10? Are they different tens? If they are the same 10, do they have to be 10? Could they be 20? Could they be minus 10? Could they be float max? We can't know without, by looking at this function. We're going to have to go into the production code and figure out what the limits are on this number. This minus one, if it was positive, we would be changing our code path through the production code and therefore would we be changing the explicit assumption that we're testing. So the first one we're going to do is try and get rid of these magic literals. We're going to put them in good semantic self-documenting variable names. And by doing that, we're going to allow ourselves to answer some of these questions without looking at production code. So that's what this is what it looks like. Obviously, we've exploded a number of lines of, of code, but that's okay because write once, read many, right? Uh, let's find that 10 again. And we can indeed see that the two tens are the same value. And I've used this prefix sum, which is something that I use in my unit tests as a, as a standard. So you can know if you see the sum prefix that this it's not important what value goes in here. It's just a value that we need to kick the system with. Here it, it's 10, but you could make it zero. You could make it float max. It wouldn't change the code path we're taking. Compare that to positive gradient. Positive gradient is saying to you, through the name that this must be a positive number. If you make it a negative number, you're going to be breaking the assumption that we're trying to test. And as an important point, I want you to take away from this, every single rule I say to you, you should know how to break. And here, I could have put direction E left into a variable, but because direction E left has to be left, the variable name would have been direction left equals direction dot E left which hasn't increased the semantic quality of the function, so there's no point doing it. So I've left it as it's, as it's plain literal. So next, what's the next thing that we could improve about this? Well, the normal reading pattern that I have when I open up unit tests is to read the unit test name and then work backwards up the test, go from the assumption, the uh, sorry, the assertion at the bottom upwards. And through that, I can start to figure out what's going on. But if we look at this variable, this test name, it's test backwards, normal leftwards gradient. I mean, that's very hard to figure out what's going on there. So let's use a better, more informative, consistent test naming standard across our whole project. And this is the standard that I use. There are many others like it, but this one is mine. And it's split into three parts. We have the name of the function of the test in the name of the test. So when the test fails, we can see the name of the production code that's failing in the test output window which is great. We can jump to that. Maybe we can fix it without opening up the unit test. We've got the name of the functional test. We've got the context of the test. That is how we need to set up the world to make sure that the, assert, the assumption we want to exercise is exercised. 
And finally, the desired result of the test, how we expect that assumption to behave. And if we take our old name and pass that through this, this new coding standard, we get this new name with direction left and vertex gradient. That's saying that the name of the function is with direction. The context is that the direction should be left. And the final behavior is that the gradient is inverted, whatever the gradient is. And if we try and adopt that reading pattern from before, we read from the top, read the name and then from the bottom up, we can see with direction left and vertex gradient. So we're looking for something to do with gradients. We know something here is called linear description. If we jump to the bottom, it says test greater value to the left. So value to the left is greater than some value or origin. And you can kind of visualize some kind of linear graph where if you go to the left of the x of current x value, then the value is going to be greater. The y value is going to be greater, and that must mean that the, the gradient is negative, which must mean that we've inverted the gradient. But so we're starting to figure out what's going on here. It's not easy, but it's much, much better than it was before. But now we know that the name of the function of the test is with direction, but where is with direction in this unit test? Let's try and pick it out. Well, if you haven't seen it already, it's there. But that's not, when we're trying to scan these unit tests quickly and figure out what's going on when they fail, we don't want to waste time trying to pick out the function of the test. So let's pull that out into its own line of code. And in doing that, we're going to also split the unit test and kind of before the call to the function of the test and after the function of the test. And that kind of setup is called an arrange act assert setup. And that allows us to, to make the unit test a lot more scannable. If you have a very good idea that the problem is in the setup of the unit test, then you can very quickly pick up where the setup is. If you have an idea that the problem is in where you're constructing the assert to the unit test, then you can very quickly jump to that part of the unit test. Very little time wasted picking apart code, figuring out what's what. If we do that to our unit test, then we get something that looks a little bit like this. So first of all, we have the arrange section. This is where we're setting up the world to exercise the assumption. Then we have the act, which is the call to the function of the test, and that must be as minimal as possible. Sometimes you're going to need some boilerplate around there. Maybe you need to call the function of the test 10 times or something. But as much as you can, you must have to make it as minimal as possible. And then finally, we have the assert section, where we're constructing a value that we can then test that the assumption was exercised correctly. And you could see we pulled a variable here down from the top because this variable is only used in the assert section, so it shouldn't be in the arrange section. And through that kind of structuring, it makes the unit test a lot more scannable. So to recap, the opaque anti pattern then is when it's hard to see how a unit test is doing what it's doing. And we fix it by demystifying the magic literals, putting them in good, informative, self-documenting names. And we use a consistent informative test name across the whole project so that we can easily look at the test output window and see what's happened. And we use the arrange actor search structure to make it easy to visually scan our unit test. So the second anti-pattern I want to show you is called, I call the wet anti-pattern. And this happens when you have some functions, say set sign distance to racing line, and you want to add a new parameter and you fix all the instances in production code, and then you compile the unit test library and you get loads of errors. And your back bends a little bit and your head drops and you're like, I'm gonna go through and fix all these by hand. But how have we got into this situation? If we open up two unit tests side by side that contain these mistakes, they might look a little bit like this. I've underlined in red where our unit test failures are, oh, sorry, our comp compilation failures. And if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see that the boilerplate of these two unit tests are very, very similar. And what I was probably thinking at the time was that I just want to get this new assumption executing. So I'm going to cut and paste this old function, change the bits I need to change, and then my unit test is executing and my job is done not thinking about the maintenance costs and implications of that. Now, in production code, we would use the maxim dry, do not repeat yourself. And this is definitely not dry, and therefore it's a wet anti-pattern. Yeah, see, see what I did, see what I did, see what I did. In production code, we wouldn't even think twice about fi fixing this. We would just pull it into its own function and then 
we wouldn't have these two repeated blocks uh, of compilation errors. We'd have compilation errors only in one function. And so we're going to do the same thing here. Let's pull it into a function. We've done that. We've already reduced the size of the unit test, which is good because it's now more readable. But there's some more we can do here. Like this, this block at the bottom as well has also got a lot of similar boilerplate. So let's pull that into its own unit test assert. And we've given the, the new assert test tau offset equal, we've given that a good informative uh, name so we know it's an assert. We know that it's not going to have any side effects. We know it might throw an exception. And in doing that, we've created these two functions now. We've given ourselves kind of a mini DSL for constructing unit tests. We've given ourselves good big Lego bricks that we can click together new unit tests with. And that's a good thing. That's going to make our unit tests more expressive and it's going to make our unit tests more maintainable. What we're not going to do is hide this call to the function of the test. We've already seen that the function of the test is like a pivot around which the whole unit test moves. It's good to pick it out because we might want to drop a breakpoint there. Uh, and also it, it kind of separates the call, the arrange section from the X section. So we don't want to hide the call to that. As tempting as it might be, we're going to keep that explicit in the unit test. So the wet anti-pattern is when you have hard to maintain hacky tests because you've been cutting and pasting stuff around, not being very dry. So all we have to do is keep those same production sensibilities that we would have in game code, we keep them for our unit test code. We don't think that just because it's executing, it's fine. You know, we go in and we refactor when things get a bit unwieldy. We use all the same tricks we would in uh, production code functions and stuff like that. Very simple stuff. But um, I found especially that when I was doing it under, under production deadlines, I just felt like I had to get this stuff executing quickly. But you have to remember the maintenance cost of this stuff as well. So we use helper functions, custom asserts to stay dry, and we do not hide the code to the function of the test. Our third anti-pattern is the deep anti-pattern. So this one happens when we added, we've added a bug to the game code, and we get a test failure, get owner offset with owner, references owner at many offsets. Now that's a bit of a vague unit test name, many offsets, is a bit weird. So already our red flag's gone up. And we're looking at production code and without looking at the unit test, it doesn't quite make sense why this unit test has failed. We would expect more information for a, a, like there's a, there's, a, there's a possible bug here, but we would expect more information if that was the case, but we're not getting it. So let's look at the unit test. So here you can see something very odd at the bottom. We've got two asserts. And we're basically testing two assumptions here. And so this is related to what I was doing, my mindset from before, where I was just trying to get something executing. I thought, if I drop the second assert in, I've got two assumptions executing uh, and double the money. That's fantastic. Except that in almost every single unit test library in existence, if an assert fails, it will throw an exception. And by throwing an exception, it's going to stop executing the rest of the unit test. So that sec if the first assert here fails, the second one will never execute. And if the second one never executes, we don't know if it's passing or failing. And if we don't know if it's passing or failing, this unit test is not trustworthy. And an untrustworthy unit test is useless. And also remember the definition of a unit test that we discussed at the start was a single explicit assumption. And here we have two explicit assumptions, therefore it's not a unit test. It's not an integration test, because an integration test has many implicit assumptions. It's nothing. We need to fix this. Uh, and that's how we know that something's wrong here. We know that when we have a unit test of this style, we've got an anti-pattern because when it's not trustworthy, it's not exactly a unit test. And we fix that exactly how I should have fixed it in the first place. We have two explicit assumptions. And now it's easier because we're using all our previous tricks to give us small Lego bricks uh, a nice expressive code. And that means that it's very easy for us to pop now into a second unit test. And once we've got those two unit tests and we run them, we can see now that also we've got much more expressive names. We've got with owner and negative offset, with owner and positive offset. We're much more explicit about the, um, about the assumptions we're trying to test. 
And when we run them, we see we get two failures. And with those two failures, we now have a complete picture and we can go and look, fix the production code properly. So the deep anti-pattern is when test failures are not fully informative because you've got too many explicit assumptions per test. Remember, a unit test is a single explicit assumption. So we minimize the amount of assumptions per test that we can, and then through that, our unit test is no longer deep, it's nice and shallow. Um, sometimes you might find that you need many asserts. You're exercising one assumption, but you need multiple asserts. Uh, so for instance, say you want to test the result from a function is an array and you want to test the arrays of the correct length and has the correct items in each slot. And that might be multiple asserts. Now, many unit test libraries will give you a single assert that compares two lists, two arrays. So you could construct an example array and compare it to the other example array, and that would give you a very informative error message. If the length was different, it would tell you which slots were different. And you can use that same pattern to do a similar thing for other cases you might have where you have to do that. Say you want to test that two or three values from a strut are identical coming out of a function. You could construct your own uh, exception that, and your own assert that through a useful exception with useful information, and there you've kept it down to one assert and therefore kept that complete picture. So our last anti-pattern then is the wide anti-pattern. This one's possibly, I think, the most important of all the anti-patterns I'm going to discuss. And this happens when you introduce a bug. We're going to introduce a bug into a class called behavior system. And when we run our unit tests, we see we get 14 test failures from that single bug. Now that's not good. Ideally, you want one unit test failure and you want that unit test name to be so expressive that you can go into production code and fix it without ever having to open the unit test or drop a breakpoint into a debugger or, or anything. That would be ideal. With two unit test failures, you can kind of do that. With three, you're getting a little bit awkward. Four is hard. 14 is ridiculous. So we need to figure out why we're getting 14 test failures here. So let's open up one of those test failures for this bug in behavior system. Uh, this is a test that failed, but something's a bit weird here. Look, look at this name. So this is testing the function called update impl in the class draft behavior. But we said we introduced the bug into behavior system. So why is this unit test failing? Well, it's failing because we're using behavior system here in the middle. We're instantiating a version of behavior system and calling a whole bunch of functions on it. And in doing that, we've brought in all of those assumptions that make behavior system what it is. They've been brought into this unit test. Now in behavior systems, unit test library, all those assumptions are explicit. They all have their own unit test. They're all explicit. They're all exercised separately. But when we're using behavior system here in this function, in this unit test, they become implicit. We're not exercising behavior system, we're assuming that it works. And by assuming that it works, we're bringing in all those assumptions implicitly. And what happens when you have greater than zero implicit assumptions? You have an integration test. Now, integration tests are cool. You need integration tests as part of your testing strategy. But we're trying to write unit tests here. So how can we fix this? Well, first, let's figure out why it's, why it's there in the first place. So when I was writing this unit test, I was probably thinking that behavior system can do some useful admin for me. It can do some bookkeeping. And because it's all unit tested itself, that's great. I don't have to worry about using it. I can use it here as much as I like because it's unit tested. I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm bringing in these implicit assumptions and they're therefore causing this unit test to fail erroneously. I remember, an erroneous test failure is an untrustworthy test. So what kind of bookkeeping are we doing? Well, we're taking an instance of draft behavior here and we're putting it into behavior system. And the behavior system update with Blackboard will call update impl for us. So we have no explicit call to update impl here, which we know is a bad thing. And then finally, we call get movement request from behavior system, which does loads of um, complicated calculations with the draft behavior. And in doing that, gives us a single float value, which we can assert against. Now, I don't want to re-implement all of that complex behavior in some unit test fun helper function. 
but I don't have to re-implement all of that. Because we're testing a single explicit assumption here, I know exactly how the output should look from draft behavior. And so I can write a very targeted, simple piece of code to replace get movement request that hopefully I can visually verify is correct. And therefore I can remove all of those implicit um, assumptions that we're bringing in by using behaviors, by using behavior system, excuse me. But first of all, we need to make that direct call to draft behavior update import. And we're going to use uh, what Royal Sharov in his book, Art of Interesting, calls a seam. And a seam is somewhere where you can slide in a fake, uh, an instance of a type, a fake type that derives from a real concrete type in your production code. Here I've highlighted heat map to help us test this assumption. We're going to provide a fake heat map to draft behavior update impulse at the seam that update impulse has provided for us by declaring a parameter. Now, the way to create seams is by inversion of control. Uh, and that means simply that draft behavior could have nude a heat map internally, written into it, and then returned it. But um, by doing that, it hasn't, it, it's got full control over the type of heat map that's created. By declaring a parameter, it's inverted that control and given it to the column function to say, okay, give me some kind of heat map and I will write into it. And by doing that, it's created a scene that we can unit test. And when I say the word inversion of control, some people listening to this video might get a bit jumpy and start thinking about abstract factory patterns and all that Java shit. And I'm, I'm not talking about that so much. Just by declaring a parameter here, we've inverted control. Now you might find the case, you might have some systems in your code where you want to go full Java and use dependency injection frameworks and all that stuff to kind of make your system as dependency inverted as possible. And that's fine. But know that the minimum you can do is just declaring a parameter and no one's scared of declaring parameters, right? So once we know we have a seam here, we have a seam, we have heat map, uh, we need to make heat map into a class that we can derive from and create an imposter version of. Uh, and we do that just by creating a virtual function here in the correct place that we can derive from. And the C++ program is watching this now and now rolling their eyes because of the V keyword. If they weren't rolling their eyes at version of control, they're now rolling their eyes at the V keyword. So yes, that's obviously going to have performance implications. But if this is only for unit testing code, if this virtual is only needed for unit testing code, then maybe you can have this in a macro. You can have some kind of processor that pulls out virtual if you're compiling for release or something, and then you're not, you, don't, you won't get that performance hit, OK? OK. And then finally, in our test library, we can then derive a new class we've called a mock heat map. It derives from heat map, and it has this function, write heat, that we can write custom code inside. And that custom code will be nice and simple, easily visually verify it's correct. And we construct an instance of that mock heat map then and then pour it into update import. And now we've used a scene, we used a fake object, and we can completely replace behavior system. And that's what it looks like now. So behavior system is gone. We now have a mock heat map instance that we pass into update import. And we have a function we can call on the mock heat map that again is very, very, very simple. It doesn't need to do all the processing that behavior system did because it's not dealing with real world edge cases. We're just dealing with this single explicit assumption. We return that value, we can have an assert. We've removed all the implicit assumptions in this, in this unit test. And we've gone from 14 test failures to 13. And we can keep going, we can do that with all the, uni uh, all the other unit tests and hopefully get us down to one or two unit test failures for the actual bug that's the problem. So to recap, the wide anti-pattern is when you have false negative test failures because you have too many implicit assumptions in your code. Remember, that's an integration test now, not a unit test. So we use seams to isolate code so we can use simple fake imposter objects. that You can go crazy and you can use um, mocking frameworks. You should Google that if you don't know what those are. Those are very, very useful for running our unit tests. Um, but at the simple end, we can just use really simple fake objects and pass them in to our function of the test, and it wouldn't be none the wiser. So to recap, the very end then, we should respect unit test source code as much as production source code. So this is like the most important point I want you to take away from this. 
don't think that as long as a unit test is executing, that's a good unit test. A good unit test is all those three qualities. They're readable, maintainable, and trustworthy. And if you need to, you might want to take time and go back and refactor your unit tests after you've written them to make sure they have those three qualities. Because when these unit tests fail and you don't know when they're going to fail, when they fail, you're going to be reading them with fresh eyes. You won't remember that one unit test out of 500 that you wrote. So assume the person reading this is not going to understand what this unit test is doing and be clear as you can about uh, how it's doing what it's doing and to make it maintainable. And remember, a unit test is only one explicit assumption, and you should minimize implicit assumptions. It's a bit of a fallacy to say you can get them to zero. There's always going to be something, even if it's only implicit assumptions of other ways in which this function behaves. But you, you know, you minimize it as much as possible. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, you can find uh, more information on my blog there, andrewfray.wordpress.com. If you want to email me for more for any specific questions, you can email me at andrewfray.gmail.com or you can leave a comment under this video and I'll try and get back to you. Uh, you can also contact me on Twitter at 10pm. Please follow me on Twitter. And if you are interested in reading more about this, a substantial part of this talk was based on information from Roy Oshroff's book, Arvid Unit Testing, which I highly recommend. Again, it's agnostic about whether you're writing unit tests before or after production code although it's extremely implicit that you should be doing it before. Um, all the tips are helpful. It's very good. It's not about single unit test libraries. It's about good practices like we've talked about here for writing unit tests. Um, Michael Feather's book, Working with Legacy Code, is good if you're interested in adding unit tests to a project that doesn't have them already. In the unit test world, legacy code, in quotation marks, means any code that doesn't have unit tests applied to it. So this book is about adding unit tests or adding new features to code that doesn't already have unit tests. And finally, Growing object oriented Software Guided by Tests is a very test driven development focused book, but it's um, a lot about how your systems emerge over time from your unit testing. It's a very good read. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>